Ads, can you hear me? Beautiful. Thanks, man. Just checking the microphone was working.
Hello, Adam. Hi, everyone. Can Hi there. You hear? How are you? Yes, how are you? Oh, hello, Scott. Hi, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. Are you one of the moderator dudes? Or? No, I'm going to present. Oh, I got you. You're one, one you're of the, the papers, the first one on convict criminology. Okay. Good, good. Okay. I was just talking to Lucas. I see Mr. Adam up there. I better. Should I mute myself, I suppose? I suppose I better. Yeah. I'm I think running at the mouth here. You never know. Yeah. Uh, we have the, the, the mediator here is. John Lobo Antunes, I think. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello. Is, is it John? It's actually Maria João, so I just go by John. Okay. John. Yeah, it's easier works. for me. It's easier for me because from Portuguese, it's easier to say João. Yes. Yeah. Just like it's easier to say Leandro Aires França. Yes. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just hiding my face. Ain't nobody got to see it. But um, we'll get started in about five minutes. So, um, okay. Scott, feel free to unmute yourself and chat if that if that's you know tickles your fancy. There's no reason to. It's hard to keep me quiet. You know. No, I mean, there's no point. I mean, let's not. We don't have to keep each other quiet. Oh, we can keep Scott quiet if we need to. Oh, um, <laughs> we oh my God. Lucas, what time is it now? Like, are you trying? <laughs> and now, last time we were speaking, it was night time. Now it's five to five in the morning. So, so did you fine. actually go to bed or you just been up all this whole time? Yeah, I did. No, okay. I did. I went to bed and then um, I, I had this bad dream that I got the time difference wrong. So I woke up at 4 a.m. and jumped up and caught the end of the last lot. So... Um, uh, good fun. Good fun. Yeah, uh, there was another presenter. I, I got the feeling that she was somewhere in Europe as well. And she came on a little bit late because she got the time zones. Gotcha. I mean, <laughs> where are you, Joan? I'm actually at Towson University. It's right outside Baltimore. Oh, OK, cool. So I'm in Maryland. OK, gotcha. So it's not. Leandro, are I you went to, I went to. Go on, Lucas, I'm listening. No, I was just saying I pl we played uh, played basketball against Towson many many years ago on a uh, on, on a trip over uh, to the states the, the the old the Tigers if I remember correctly. Yes, right? we are. <laughs> yes, yeah. we are. Yeah, Leandro, where are you? I am Brazil. Oh in yeah, the south of Brazil. The south. Yeah. Uh, is there what is the time difference? Is it one hour? It's or two hours actually. Oh, so you're more to the west. Yeah, it's almost six now here. Yeah, I've only been to Recife and Natal. Oh, very far away from here. I know. We're near, <laughs> yeah, we're near Argentina, Uruguay. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have some friends that live in Sao Paulo and Rio. That's where I was born, actually. That's the biggest city we have in Latin America, right? Yeah, Rio. Yeah, that's near. That's near Sao Paulo. Yeah. I have a friend that also lives in Annapolis and in Brasilia. Yeah. All right. Leandro, we're nearly ha there. So let's see. Go on. Leandro, go how's, the, um, how's the convict criminology development stuff going, man? I'd love to catch up with you offline because I'm doing the – trying to set up the Australian um, leg here. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously plugging along and, and working with Andreas and Sasha and, and all the guys from the UK and US as well. So it'd be good to touch base offline and, and um, yes, for sure. share, yeah. share some war stories. Okay. Cause we are just 
is starting it here in Brazil. It's new. Same, same. We're, yeah. we're just at the point where we're trying to get some, trying to get enough support to try and make the group a formal thematic group. So it's, and yeah, so we're hundred percent with you. So it might be good for us to touch base. We might be able to help each other with some of the, oh, yeah, for sure. some of the experiences yeah. we're, we're flying with. I'll, um, I'll grab your um I'll grab your details offline and we'll touch touch base and have a chat ourselves sometime during the thing, yeah? Okay, I, I think I can I'll send you my email in the chat just a second. Yeah, perfect. That's my email there. Beautiful. Thanks, man. I'll uh, I'll whip you an email now so you got mine as well. Okay. Look at this breaking down. Joan, you're you're breaking down international barriers by just being here, mate. <laughs> uh, this is my number. I haven't actually stopped. So you've been going since you've been going since I spoke to you before. Yes, I have. Oh my, oh my goodness. Yes, I have. And I presented have you, as well. Have you got the stream all day? Are you looking after the, the, the lot all day? Well, no, but we, because I'm, I'm, so there's the VP, the president, there's the president, then there's me, then there's the secretary, then there's two counselors. And we basically divvied it up between us because we weren't very, we weren't sure how this would work, right? It's, we haven't done it before. We had three, over 300 entries. We weren't sure how to operate if how smoothly it would go if there would be uh f ups you know just so it, there was a lot of uncertainty so we didn't in a way did, we didn't want to hand over the reins to others without us you know because we've we've met consistently every week several if necessary several times to figure out how we were going to run it and it was decided that for this run that most of the um streams would be hosted by the crimcon board that's just to see if we could just to see because then it would be our responsibility right if we screwed up how could we fix it and then we'd have all the passwords all the information all the contacts in in order to and then also if i screw up i'll go yeah sorry my bad you know oopsies and there's less of a repercussion than if we had asked i don't know a grad student or someone they might feel like they don't have the agency to make decisions or like that, if I screw up, it's my responsibility as VP, and then I'll apologize profusely and <laughs> hope I don't get in big trouble. And sincerely, too. Pardon? And sincerely. And sincerely. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit, my eyes are a little bit iffy at the moment after all these presentations, but it's, but it's actually also been great for me because I've been exposed to a bunch of um, research I, I, I haven't ever, and I get to meet people from Brazil, from Italy, from, Australia without actually making a bad joke about saying something like good day mate <laughs> I had to I had to my bad all right let's get started um hi I'm Joan Antunis I am your host I will be mostly quiet I hope I haven't actually had to mute anybody there was this plan not mine because that's that causes great anxiety that we would mute you after 10 minutes and call it a day. I actually haven't had to do that. And I don't plan on doing that at all today because we have three presentations here. Yeah, we only have three presentations at 10 minutes each. We can certainly go over a little bit without me being, you know, anxiety inducing and and mute you all, so it's fine. And then my suggestion is that you can either post in the Q&A and I will release it so that the um, presenters can see, or you can post in the chat, whichever you prefer. I will keep an eye on it. And the plan is to do a Q&A once everybody's presented. I feel like that's better, then we can generate a conversation. For the panelists, you can just unmute and ask your questions. And um, good luck, and I look forward to listening to your work. So, Leandro, I think you're up first. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to talk about COVID criminology in Brazil, uh, development and adaptations. Can I share a screen here? Yeah. Can you see it? Okay. Perfection. Uh, perfect. 
Perfect. Uh, I'll start with a, a little background, okay? Uh, COVID criminology researchers identify Frank Tannenbaum as the pioneer in the field. However, the development of this movement, as we know it today, started in 1970s when John Irving published The Felon. Convicted for armed robbery, he served a five-year prison sentence. And after that, he obtained a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Other researchers went through similar paths and started to present criminological works with a perspective rarely seen before, the first-hand experience of imprisonment. This new movement was presented to the academic community at the American Society of Criminology annual meeting in San Diego, 1997. Four interrelated factors led to the birth of convict criminology. First, the multiplicity of criminological perspectives. Second, acknowledgement of the failure of prisons. Third, publications of inside perspectives. And fourth, development of ethnographic methods. On the first publication on the matter, Stephen Richards and Jeffrey Ian Ross defined convict criminology originally as a set of essays and empirical research done by convicts or ex-cons in possession of a PhD or on the way to completing one, or interested academics who make critics of existing literature, policies, practice, contributing as a result to a new perspective on criminology, criminal justice, and corrections. It's important to note that the primary architects of the movement are those who served years behind prison walls and now work as academics, merging their past with their present to present and provide a provocative approach to the academic study of their field. Convict criminologists act in different fronts, academic production, advocacy for reforming prison system, informing public opinion and public policy, mentorship of student prisoners who wish to become academics, and support to ex-con fellows. In the development of this new criminological school, some challenges emerged and were properly addressed by the authors on this field. The first question, for example, is there any gatekeeping related to which convictions are allowed or not within the group? Most convict criminologists serve time for drug-related offenses, but questions were raised regarding specific crimes like violent and sexual offenses. The group does not exclude or discriminate by criminal offense and respects participants' decision of concealing their criminal background. Another question, are non-cons allowed in the group? As Neil Bowden Ross argued, the prison experience is no substitute for careful conducted research, and it is agreed that the group needs academic legitimation. Third, are the minorities equally represented within the group? Women and racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented in convict criminology. After many criticisms, researchers have admitted it and have been working on addressing this problem. A fourth question that can be presented, how to in internationalize convict criminology when limits are placed around travel for those with criminal convictions? Difficulties in mobility, in fact, impact networking and mentoring. In this line, the development of convict criminology in countries with less restricted immigration policies would allow researchers to meet and establish a more globalized movement. And a final question that could be raised is how the participants should be called. Uh, convict criminology has had internal debates about the uses of languages, of language. Alexandra Cox recently wrote a piece on the uses of stigmatizing and first person person first languages in the context of incarceration. In this work that was published in 2020, she also shows how some movements have reclaimed stigmatized terms as an act of empowerment and resistance, as it is the case of convict criminology. Now I'm going in this final part of this presentation, I, I want to talk about this internationalization of convict criminology. Uh, the American and the British groups have different projects which aim to instruct and capacitate convicted people, helping them entering universities or getting a job after their release. 
in the USA, the original requirement of ex-cons possessing uh, a PhD or on the way to complete one to join the movement reveals a particular perspective of, of the American strain that sees convict criminology as a transformative path. And by this, I mean it's planning a journey that would take them out of prison and into college. The British Convict Criminology, BCC, was established in 2011. Despite sharing the same underlying philosophy and critical theory, theoretical orientation as their American colleagues, and also the same language, the British Convict Criminology participants face another reality. reality. Uh, the British strain main authors have worked on the connection between prison and university. And what about Brazil? It is worth asking how this project may be developed in, developed in Brazil and what is its relevance in the face of our reality. Inspired and informed by the experiences of this criminological movement that is developed in different parts of the globe, the Contemporary Criminology Study Group, which I coordinate, established in Porto Alegre, launched the project Criminologia de Condenados. Our aim is to instruct Brazilians ex-cons in prison studies with a specific focus on convict criminology to foster them as qualified researchers and introduce the convict perspective in the Brazilian criminological literature. Therefore, it is crucial to understand the context of our country, assessing similarities, differences, and peculiarities in relation to the convict criminology original proposal. Similar to the North American and European cases, prison and incarcerated people are studied by an overwhelming majority of criminological experts with little or no firsthand experience with prison and or prisoners. They are writing about phenomena they have never personally experienced. At the same time, according to official data, near half of incarcerated people have only primary education and only 0.5% of the prison population has concluded higher education. Considering most never had access even to the minimal education, it, is, it seems unlikely that many of those who experienced imprisonment will search for an education qualification, at least a PhD. Another specific problem is that prison conditions in Brazil don't allow a safe and enabling environment for any long-term academic project. So with these and other peculiarities in mind, di different from the American transformation model and the British connection model, we propose to instruct and mentor a few individuals who have served time in different penal institutions as criminological authors, so they will be able to produce prison-related knowledge according to their own experiences and perspectives supported by scientific methodology provided by our study group. And that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Next, we'll have you, Lucas. Thank you. Let me just get my screen up and we're good to go. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, obviously, coming after Leandro, there's a few things that he has mentioned and discussed in his presentation that I will skip past a little bit because uh, some of the background stuff I've completed in mine as well, not knowing that we would have the two of us with such similar spaces. But uh, there's, yeah, so for flipping through. Um, we, yeah, so we're looking at uh, Australia in regards to um, introduction of comic criminology. Comic criminology is in its infancy here. Uh, we're in the process of completing and about to um, um, send through a, a, a paper for publishing with the guys from the UK. So with uh, Dr. Andreas Oresti and Dr. Sasha Dark, uh, we've been working at 
looking at the barriers inside Australia um, in regards to setting up um, the, the Convict Criminology Group. So again, Convict Criminology, um, Leandro has, has outlined what it is, so I'll uh, keep skipping along, but it's effectively um, the collection of individuals um, you know, that, that are looking to uh, make sure that we are benefiting from uh, in, from the use of experience and from the use of having people that have actually served time and have been involved in the criminal justice system, providing information um, into, into the space. Um, I, again, as uh, Leandro mentioned, is the, the key activities of CC movement, um, the conduct, publish, present, assist, provide, contribute and assist. The, the, each country from, from my research and from my discussions have unique um, unique challenges in each of these spaces. Um, initial really good close conversations with 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 with, with Jeffrey with Jeffrey and Ross and with Shad Maruna and Grant Tetchy and Daniel Kavish and even Greg you know, Greg Newbold and the other guys that have been in this from the start. I've initiated and, and discussed with me a lot of the challenges that are faced here. We still face these today in, in, in the infancy um, in regards to my own space um, in my in my own. Um, extensive knowledge of CC. Um, it, it's, it's not quite there in regards to what we need to be doing. And, and that I think highlights the infancy of the entire country and the entire space. So we are at a different stage at the moment in Leandro and also um, some of the other countries, but there's some big steps being taken behind the scenes to try and get us to where we need to be. Um, the primary goals um, obviously uh, were discussed um, prior and, and we're trying to remain as strong as we can with these three. And that's again, to transform the way research and prisons is conducted. Um, it was mentioned before that, you know, there's a lot of stuff being written about, uh, you know, for, and I call it textbook, textbook learnt. And there's obviously a space for that in research, but yeah, you know, the ability to enhance research by including people with lived experiences is untold. Um, and with, um, you know, with, with, with criminal, um, or the incarceration backgrounds um, to provide into that space. Second is to make sure that um, you know, we, we are articulating, articul articulating policy reform and having a voice around that table. Um, there, there's some big reforms and some big changes going here in regards to education um, in incarceration. And it's really exciting to, to be around those discussions and around those conversations. Um, myself and a few other um, others with um, previous incarceration experience are, are being actively engaged in, in spaces with corrections uh, and also with other private um, businesses and private groups who are actually working inside to, to, to change the policy and process regarding education. And part of our big focus on that is because of the infancy of where Australia is, we don't have the, the critical mass or the numbers that of people that are coming out with doctorates or coming out with masters or PhDs or the interest to get involved in that, that a lot of countries with bigger incarceration numbers have. So for us, is it's, it's, it's very much that infancy stage where we need to change that now to start working with great universities such as University of Southern Queensland, um, University of Southern Cross, where we can then engage some of the guys now and get them into the process of working towards um, I'm obviously only a fairly early career academic, but um, I'm working with a handful of guys now that are either incarcerated or, or, or previously incarcerated and working towards with them um, in the space of criminology, but also in the space of education, because that is one of the big differences um, between the US system, for example, in Australia compared to the UK system in here. There's a lot of very good similarities between all three, but the UK similarities, and I don't know whether it's through um, you know, the, the, the basis of our country essentially being a, a, a colonised uh, a colonized English section. There's some, some great similarities and that's why Shad, and, uh, sorry, that's why uh, Sasha and, and Andreas uh, came in to work on this, uh, this piece together with me. So a few difficulties, again, we'll, we'll keep ticking through these, but the smaller numbers of people in Australia means less previously incarcerated people, smaller amount of universities and the smaller amount of um, the smaller amounts of schools of criminology. Um, currently, as we speak, there is no schools that that um, no schools in, in in Australia, no universities in Australia that include convict criminology or the like um, in their um, in their curriculum. And that's something that we're working hard to change. We're at the moment getting to the stage where we have six universities that um, I'm engaging with to have guest lecture guest lectures and space where we can get in and start the discussion and we can start 
this uh, this conversation and let it let it grow. And and it's been successful thus far. There is still a reluctance to hire previously incarcerated people. Um, as as um, in spaces, there are obviously universities that have their own selection processes, but there are some that will um, vehemently suggest that they will not hire people with um, with criminal records in any of their spaces. Um, reviewing literature has found that there has been minimal uh, minimal to zero um, formal concerted efforts to formalise CC in Australia, um, and we continue to face um, you know, challenges in that area now. And then what we talked about before is research being written by people without the experience. Um, okay, some additional, some additional issues. And this is, a, a, again, what Leandro mentioned about the contextual stuff that, that is completely different in, in each country, in each space. And the word convict here in the name has huge connotations here. And that goes back to Australian history through, uh, through the colonisation of effectively boatloads of, of, of convicts for the sake of the, the use of the word. Um, arriving in the country, and uh, and and that that has caused some huge issues for um, for Indigenous people, um, Indigenous uh, Indigenous people here, or First Nations people in Australia, are overrepresented in um, in the incarceration space, but are underrepresented when it comes to the voice in this area. So, in order to be an effective um, group that that can represent and in, and, and include. Um, the Indigenous voice in this space is that there is some, some, some been some huge discussions regarding the name. Uh, there is there is large groups of Indigenous um, researchers, academics, um, groups that will not get involved in a group that has the word convict in it because it um, represents their space um, and it represents their culture. Um, in a negative light. So then in, in these conversations or these brief discussions regarding name change, it then brings in other challenges um, because then it waters down in some way, shape or form, the inclusion and the importance of having previously incarcerated in this space and not just any Tom, Dick or Harry that has seen a prison, sent a letter to a prison or read a story about a prison. And so there's a little bit of, of making sure that we're honouring those guys that have worked hard in the past, but also on making sure that the boundaries and lines are set for people moving forward. An interesting thing that um, was mentioned about the Brazil um, states before was um, the stigma of some offences and who should be in and who should be out. We're finding some really interesting um, kickback um, to discussions regarding um, the involvement of some offenders. Um, there is groups of, of, of academics that will not be involved in some spaces in, um, in domestic violence areas. If domestic violence offenders um, are, are involved, is that there's been some kickback or some, uh, some, some repercussions for that. There's been some that are suggesting potentially about um, you know, drug related or sex offenders. And that's similar to what, uh, what was mentioned before. So there's some, some exploration in that space that is, uh, that is really important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so obviously, what does it bring to Australia, uh, to the Australian criminology? It's a fast growing university industry. Criminology is the largest growing um, fast space um, in Australia. So the time is now to get into this area. We have a really good basis of, of support in academia through the majority of, of universities. Um, and, and, and yeah, obviously some are much warmer than others, but we're getting there. Um, the rising prison population means more returned citizens. That means there's more formally incarcerated people getting education and that gives us the chance to, to work at encouraging, you know, prospering and developing the skills of those guys coming out so that we can get more people with um, lived experience um, and incarceration into um, academia. And then obviously um, it provides a better balance for, uh, for everything across the board. Uh, again, nothing, nothing that you guys don't know who are involved in this is insider perspective. Uh, the insider perspective work has been done previously. This is a really new space where conversations have been challenging um, with some, um, some academics in this space in Australia um, is that there is, a, there is a balance here between how things have always been done um, and how things may be done or possibilities moving forward. And that, that's not unique to, uh, to the US guys, to the Italian guys, to the UK guys, and I'm sure that uh, to the same to the Brazilian guys, is that there is a big belief that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, the, question, the question of insider perspective. So the ability to have this provides us with the chance to get in and then develop a larger detailed link um, and then provide more balanced research. 
just in closing, um, obviously some of the best researchers in the world um, are here in Australia. Some of the best um, you know, criminologists uh, in the world or the most written criminologists in the world are here in Australia. It's just a real challenge at the moment to make sure that we can sell the importance of lived experience plus research and academic skills. And that goes right back to the first discussion that even um, was mentioned by my Brazilian counterparts about the importance that academic skills don't just replace um, or can't just be replaced by someone that's seen the inside of a, of a prison cell and the importance to make sure we merge the two. Um, I myself uh, am working to make sure that I continue to develop my own skills so that I can be a light here um, and to keep working along that space. So if we're able to put the two together, we can enrich research, we can increase balanced decision making and policy development, and we can, as we're all here to do, assist the men and women who are impacted by the criminal justice system here in Australia. Um, any questions, there's my email address. would love to chat further um, you know, about what, when and how, and um, would love to hear from other people regarding this. And I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you. No, that was great. Thank you so much. All right, Adam, Scott and Lucas, <laughs> you're on. Get our screen up here. There we go. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, greetings one and all. I'm Scott from Michigan in the US and thank you for joining us here for this first CrimCon conference. Uh, we are humbled and honored to be included in order to share the stories of our lived experiences with you. And we'll be joined shortly by Adam and Lucas. Um, the title of our presentation is an autoethnographic look at the challenges faced by incar previous incarcerated people in the USA and Australia. And this long winded title describes fully what this presentation is all about. Our presentation, this autoethnographic study comes to you from three men, one in Australia and two in the US. In it, we examine the effects that mass incarceration has, on, has had on each of us. Each of us looks at three different areas of our lives which shape our shared and lived experiences. These experiences are formed and often warped by the cogs of the prison industrial complex. This complex, powerful, relentless, and driven by greed and indifference, creates challenges which obviously impact incarcerated men and women, but continues to substantially influence lives after release from jails and prisons. The challenges are often dictated by circumstance, prejudice, and archaic practices and policies. Oftentimes, programs and policies originally designed to help formerly incarcerated people end up hurting and needlessly handicapping parolees and probationers. Now here's Lucas. Sorry that you have to hear my voice back to back. Um, I had the great chance to work with um, work with a couple of the, 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 these great men in the US. Um, and funnily enough, it, the experiences from people, you know, thousands and thousands of kilometers or miles apart from each other are actually amazingly similar. And that I suppose in the first breath um, that in the first breath gave us the idea that, which has been researched um, to, to, um, you know, to, to the end and back, that this system is how this system is designed to be. It's, it's the same system errors, it's the same system occurrences in Australia, in the US, um, and, and in other places throughout the world. And we looked at um, you know, a, a couple of things that affected us. And the first one was, was education, um, in my breath. And the ability to gain access to education um, was extraordinarily challenging, it remains extraordinarily challenging for some people who are returning home. Unlike some places in the US is that, that you're not asked in Australia if you have a criminal record to, to, to gain access to education. However, there's no support for those that do. There is that no opportunities through parole. There's no opportunities that are supported to get guys or girls that have returned home involved in education. We still pay for education, which, which obviously is, is is important because it values and some people believe um, in both countries and some people believe that uh, the education we've got inside is free and that so uh, you know you go to jail and get a free education and, 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 and I'm looking at a large um, government student debt that a study that I did while I was inside and I know that's the same for a lot of other guys so some of the education is restrictive when we get outside the second is insurance and credit now without going into my um, offences too hard, but I, I was involved in, a, in some white collar offences. And that now effectively makes it almost near impossible for me to gain access to 
insurance and credit to some extent. So it's, a, it's, it's an often forgotten thing where um, if you're involved in a, 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 a fraudulent based uh, crime, you're effectively blacklisted for five to 10 years for insurance or, or, or credit. So you come home, you return back, you want to start a business, you, you're a builder and you need to get tools or, or a truck. Um, you need to pay for that yourself. You can't get access to, to credit. You can't get access to insurance. So, you know, as a, as a space now is we're in a rental home, my family are in a rental home because we can't get access to credit um, to, to then get a home loan and continue to move on. So there's challenges with that. And it also then becomes insurance wise as well. So insurance looks at, um, you know, risk, obviously I understand there's mathematics used in it, but risk um, and, and it makes um, getting insurance um, almost um, impossible for those, uh, those who come back with, with records. And the third one for, that, that affects me and continues to, and I know I'm not the Lone Ranger in saying this, is, is the media is uh, one state in Australia, and it's the last state that's done it, has just um, just introduced in the last couple of months the ability to um, expunge uh, records after five years, those for minor records. Uh, every other state in Australia has done this previously. However, it, it almost becomes a pointless exercise because you continue to get names and continue to get things um, rolled through the media um, in an ongoing space. Um, you know, a, a researcher or an edu oh, sorry, a journalist will do a paper on some type of activity and they will drag names up that have done this in the past. And what happens is that names keep robbing to the front of the line, front of the line, front of the line. You put a Google, Google search on um, onto local papers throughout Australia in some spaces where offending's taken place. And someone that may have offended in a, a, a drug related space or, or white collar space or even an assault space has their name continuously brought up 10, 15, 20 years down the track and cannot escape the stigma of that. So you get to a job space and you, you, you know, through most HR places will put in, um, you know, most good HR places now do an online search of your name. And if media is continuously rolling your name out in that space, then it's very hard to escape that or very hard to then move on from that. And I think the media, the, 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 there needs to be some more look and review of media practices in that area. Um, we go into this a lot more detail in a paper that we're hoping to get published shortly that's been submitted to it, but we'd also love to have conversations with other people regarding the expansion of these ideas down the track. So I will pass it on to my next learned colleague and you won't have to hear my voice again for the rest of the session. I won't make any comment on that part of it. Uh, my name is Adam Grant and um, but part of my contribution to this paper is I was just released in January after serving 27 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. So I'm still fresh to this and released to the coronavirus and everything else has been an interesting, um, to put it mildly, reintroduction to society. But I love the concept of convict criminology because it's one of these movements of nothing about us without us. It doesn't make any sense to have a bunch of people speaking about something theor theoretically when you have people with lived experience that can share these things with it and that are educated and learned in the other factors of it. So the three pieces that I uh, uh, addressed in my paper were recent and they had to do with housing and here in the United States, um, they still run background checks on you and can deny you for housing based on arbitrarily because you have any kind of a conviction anyway. Remember, my conviction is 27 years old and I was denied housing. I was even denied access to Airbnb recently because of my, um, incar my previous incarceration. I also addressed ban the box because we sometimes forget and are too short-sighted in the way that we look at these things. And so in some of the states, they have banned the box from the employment application uh, the problem is, is that you haven't banned the stigma. And so people still do a background check after they do uh, your interview. And often there is a standing policy or procedure by the companies that will not let, allow them to hire you, um, depending on what your conviction may be or depending how recent it may be, or just period. There's nothing that precludes them from using that against you. And finally, in the vein of uh, convict criminology, I'm a big proponent of uh, lived experience. 
um, because to me, it turns pain into purpose. Um, 27 years was a painful experience, but being able to share that with other people is the opportunity to help people and to keep them from having to make the same, make the same mistakes that I have. So I work in a field, I'm a peer recovery coach that is about my lived experience, but it still precluded me from certain levels of employment because it seemed that I had a little bit too much experience um, for what they wanted um, to involve me in. So the field of convict criminology is huge because so often academia has led the way um, in, in so many different facets of our society. And I think if we're going to truly be proponents of the lived experience, then we have to do it with something like convict criminology. So thank you for your time. And I have to introduce Scott, that was terrible. <laughs> I, was good, I was gonna pout there for a minute, but I decided I better not. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Adam. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, punishments that come across people that have been uh, released from, from prisons and or jails. And my things are transition, fines and costs, and electronic monitoring and GPS, which are all things that I've experienced and I know many, many others have as well. Um, and I speak of, um, we talk of a swinging door for women and men released from jail and prison, but for many the door looks more like a revolving one. This is a revolving door of recidivism that many formerly incarcerated men and women spend much of their time trying not to get sucked back into. Mass incarceration has swelled the US population from 400,000 in 1970 to over 2 million today, with two thirds of those being either black or non-white men and women. The first relevant feature of mass incarceration is the abandonment of rehabilitation as a central goal of criminal justice. Punishment has become the dominant paradigm. In my personal experience, this transition to punishment has been dramatized by the many forms of financial punishment the state subjects you to during parole and probation. For example, I was forced to pay for my 18 months of state prison incarceration or have my house impounded by the state and sold out from under my family. Additional expenses include fines, costs, restitution, electronic monitoring, and daily fees for the honor of wearing a GPS monitor around your ankle for 18 months. And these are imposed by the courts and other criminal justice agencies. The revolving door that I speak of is lubricated by the pile of debts and responsibilities that return citizens incur. Remember in our present paradigm, the fundamental purpose of imprisonment is not the correction, but the punishment of criminal behavior. Okay, we're gonna go back to Lucas for the uh, conclusion. So Lucas, we are stuck with you again, sir. Sorry, my screen just disappeared on me. Um, yeah, it just completely dropped off. All right. Um, yeah, so as we mentioned, is, is this is obviously a real a, a snapshot. Um, you know, the, the, the paper that we've done has been, you know, a year in the making. And, you know, we're obviously discussing the ability to then expand this further because the lived experiences of us, granted, we are three white middle-aged male, males and conversations we've had with, um, in, in Indigenous, African American, other minority groups, female groups um, along the journey, the, the barriers are very, very similar. And we are looking to explore this further in a, set of, uh, in a set of other papers as we keep progressing along here. But for the sake of the exercise is that, um, as I said, I'm in, I'm, I'm in Australia, in Perth, and Adam and Scott are both in uh, Michigan in the US. And we're always looking for collaborations and opportunities to keep moving along the lived the importance of lived experience and then convict criminology in its own. So here's our contact details. We would love to have you guys hit us up um, and do some more work, but the importance is everyone's individual experience is individual to themselves, but the barriers to coming back out again are so similar across, um, across spaces that are so far away that it's uh, that it almost looks to us as if it may be a systematic a systematic thing, which we all know it is. But um, anyway, thank you guys very much for your time and uh, we'll open up for questions. Awesome. There are um, two comments slash questions in the Q&A that you can, any, that they're directed at any panelists. So you can just take a look. 
and generate the conversation. Leandro, do you want, do maybe both of us, Leandro, do we both have a chat of that first one? And talk yeah, maybe we, the Brazilian context and the Australian context? Yeah, my, my reply to this is, is pretty much uh, a simple one because uh, convict criminology just started in Brazil this year because our study group is presenting this for the first time. People never heard of it. And the only mentions we had were from some papers that were translated. So people didn't know. So we don't have yet barriers to, um, for this idea of convict criminology in academ um, at the academic uh, universe. So uh, I think what we have been um, receiving as a feedback is that many people are really interested in this idea. We have talked about, about this project with um, uh, other researchers, uh, judges, prosecutors, and they are all interested in hearing more about this. Of course, we in Brazil, Brazil is a very conservative country, is a very punitive country, and it's not living its best days in the last few years. Anyway, I, we have found uh, some support from many different people and many different areas. But this is on the beginning, so we haven't faced any other really strong challenge until now. Probably on, on, in an Australian context, it's uh, it's similar. I think we're even possibly further back than that. Is that we have um, we have a significant level of interest. It's been a, a lot of work in engaging with you know pretty much every university in the country or as close to. Um, representatives inside their criminology spaces and one of the biggest things we've found is the first part is where the school of criminology sits um, in each of the universities so there, there's been a different level of feedback coming back through to me if the school of criminology sits in the school of law for argument's sake compared to it sitting in the school of social social education or, or social sciences is the schools of social sciences and the academics in that space seem far more um, open, not all, not all, and that's a, a stereotypical comment, but but a, a, a generally more open to the fact of including lived experience in their research, where some of the some of the the, the, the legal schools are a little bit less um, a little bit less open to the idea. Um, but what we're working, we, we've worked to, and we didn't think it would come this soon, but we have put it on the back burner. Is that we're working to attempt to formalize the group through um, the Australian New Zealand Society of Criminology, but um, through some great discussion with, um, with, with, with some of the, um, the US guys and also the UK guys is we've, we've parked that a little bit and we wanna make the informal um, group a little bit stronger first. So incorporate more presentations such as this, more papers written, more work where we're including this space in greater conversations because there is still a lack of understanding um, that lived experience is a big, big change in terminology here. Lived experience is a big movement, but lived experience can also um, water down the idea of comic criminology because we're talking about incorporating everyone into this space. And there's still discussions about convict criminology not including, you know, not including the the person that changed the sheets uh, at a one prison cell one time. That doesn't give them the ability to come into that space. So. In regards to the first question about the informal barriers, that, that's some of them. Um, also, there's still an element um, in some, um, some gatekeepers and some spaces where there is what, and, and I've had this term used to me by a couple of people in, in great conversations about the inherent risk of employing people with um, criminal records. And that's still a stigma that remains um, and will continue to remain here. Um, and we just have to keep breaking down um, chip by chip and I'm sure the US guys and I'm sure Leandro and I know the UK guys were the same. There's sometimes that you feel like just throwing the toys out of the cot and saying, no, nah, this is too hard. This is too hard. And, but you know what, there's, there's people still to come and there's people currently inside that need the voice and we've got to take the hits because that's what it's going to take to, to, to get opportunities for other people. And, and I can see Leandro shake, nodding his head. That uh, it must be similar challenges there. So 
Thank you. I think Lucas hit the nail on the head too with the, the stigma aspect. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about ac academia or uh, society at large, language matters. And a lot of times these things are being framed in a way that don't, that are not conducive to more conversation. And I think that's where um, convict criminology is extremely important. Lucas mentioned the fact that convict has a connotation to it and a stigma that comes to it in Australia. And it kind of does in the United States too, but in the opposite context, because a lot of guys wear it as a bad, badge of honor. Um, so we really have to be conscious about the language um, that we're using um, and the parameters for who we include and who we don't. I think everyone should be included in the conversation, including the guy who changed the sheets one time in the county jail. He just shouldn't be speaking the same way as somebody such as myself who served 27 years because those are two different experiences. So we need to find a way to become more inclusive instead of academia has often been an exclusive club. And so I think we need to kind of broaden the tent a little bit. Well said, well said. There's another comment by um, Jeffrey Ian Ross, which is more of a comment and a, a really um, laudatory. It's 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 great to see, and 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 this is this is not a, a smoke blow for Jeffrey, but it's uh, to to have someone you know who's such a pioneer in this criminal the convict criminology space, such as Jeffrey. Um, yeah, in this area, and 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 as he mentioned in his paper, is that or in in his comment, is that you know the, the American Convict Criminology Group is now a formal division of uh, of the American Society of Criminology, and I know that as mentioned, is I know that's something that we had as a long term goal in Australia that probably crept up on us a little bit quicker than we were thinking it was going to, and it's something that we've put on the back burner because we're not there ready yet to get into that space in a formal point but there's definitely some learnings um from that and the opportunity to have it formally recognized in 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 such a carceral state as the u.s means that it has validity and this is validity that others allow around the world now can use um, as a driving mechanism to assist in, in in having their own groups recognized so um yeah thank you um jeffrey for for, for watching today one, one thing I was going to mention, too, in regards to the, the earlier questions, too, is one, one thing that we have, I know, in the States, and I know Adam has participated in some of this, too, um, that there's an opportunity at a lot of the universities, um, like the University of Michigan, where I've got some affiliation and I've been active with the Prison Creative Arts Project there. Um, anytime there's those kind of opportunities for, you know, uh, people with the lived experience to be in, engaged and involved with those projects is really important because it, it gives you connection with people in academia that are, you know, the, the people at the university plus the students and other people who are community members that are participating with that that may be involved with agencies or whatever, but it, it gives, um, I think it lends a lot of credibility to um, our community um, as being there, being engaged, being helpful, being, you know, trying to um, do good things within the community context and within the, the, the efforts that the university is, is putting forth to engage, you know, formerly incarcerated folks and returned citizens. And I think that's important to, to, uh, for us to reach out wherever we get those opportunities and, be, and try to be aware of those things and take advantage of those things um, to, to engage with folks. Can I say something really quickly here about Jeffrey message? Um, I want to thank you first, Jeffrey, for attending this section. And um, just to help everyone who is listening to us, he mentioned there is this new division of convict criminology. You can access it's concrim.org. That's the website. I, I am part of the Division of International Criminology and I discovered this specific website and division of convict criminology by accident. I, and I was really happy to see that. So everyone can visit now. It's concrim.org. Thank you.
you so much, everybody. Great. I think I see one more. Oh. Thank you, everyone, for the um, really great. I really appreciate all of your presentations and all of your perspectives. It has been um, awesome. And I want to thank all of the attendees who took time on a busy hump day afternoon to come and listen to everybody speak. It's been really wonderful. Our first day of CrimCon is now officially over. And I look forward to seeing all of you in person, hopefully, as soon as this pandemic's under control. And I hope to see a lot of you in other panels. And um, I wish you all a great afternoon. And for you, Lucas, <laughs> have a great day. Can I go back to bed now, Joan? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I wish I could, but I have grading to do. So <laughs> I'll send you my grading. You can do it. <laughs> he needs all the beauty rest he can get. <laughs> <laughs> so, Happy night. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. And thank great you for future. contributing to our success today. It has been inspiring. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.